Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. To those of you who are here in the sanctuary, it's good to see you. Um, it's good to have visitors with us. We're always glad to see and meet some new people. So um, we pray that your time with us in this worship service will be a time of blessing where you'll experience God's presence because we are in God's presence. Also, welcome to those of you watching online on Facebook or YouTube or the Community Access Channel. We're very grateful for you that you join us each week, and um, we pray that you too will experience God's blessings today. Our altar flowers today are in honor of Bruce and Alita Gross's wedding anniversary this week. So I, I don't know how many it is, but I'm sure it's worth clapping for. <laughs> And Bruce has an announcement for us, and it's not about his marriage. <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> One of the things that led Alita and me to first English was outreach, like God's work, our hands. God's work, our hands in 2021 had challenges, like COVID and newbies, like Alita and me. Last year, the planning committee changed Synod's time frame since we got such a late start in planning. Yet response from you all, despite COVID, was awesome. We, the committee, are again changing Synod's time frame. Since we've gone from two Sunday services to only one, which starts at 9.30, Saturday fits our needs better. So this year, God's work, our hands, is set up for Saturday, September 24th. We are adding another school, Washington Elementary, where we have two teachers, Kelly and Rochelle, and students enrolled there. I'm asking you for this event, don't be a Lutheran. Don't sit in the back of church and don't wait to sign up. Please sign up early since we have lots to do this year if we can find the folks to do it. Plus, we need to know how many folks to plan for vittles. Your traditional response has been wonderful and we look forward to working with you on September 24th. The committee thanks you. I was thinking about the year 2017 when we had 100 people who volunteered. It was just really exciting. We had things for everybody to do. So please do sign up early. It gets discouraging when we um, see the empty sheets staring at us and we've got all these plans going. I don't think the sheets are up yet, but as soon as they're up, please help. Um, I also want to mention, you've, you see them in your bulletin and on the screen each week, that we'd like to reestablish the coffee time after church. Um, we need some help with Altar Guild, and that's not an every week commitment. It happens every few months where you help set up the table for communion. Um, and we need help with Sunday school. And none of these is a, a, where you sign your li life away for 13 years or anything like that. It's, these are short-term commitments, but we really do need help if we're going to re reorganize and have those as part of our um, service to one another again now after COVID. And just to mention that B. Miller's memorial service is this Saturday in Prentice, Wisconsin. The address is in your bulletin, or you can call the office for it if you're online watching. Um, the family welcomes you to make the beautiful trip up there and spend time remembering this wonderful woman, B. Miller. And now let's prepare our hearts for worship. Would you please stand? Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come before you with anticipation. 
eager to find out how you will meet with us here this morning. Thank you for your presence and for your promises and for all the provisions you give us in every way to live in this world and to live well. We pray that you will open us up to whatever words, feelings, changes you have in mind for us. Help us to trust your goodness and your greatness. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sins, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Hear God's words of forgiveness for you. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also also with you. you. Please remain standing as we sing together, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
Let us pray. O God, God, mighty mighty and immortal, you know know that that as fragile fragile creatures surrounded by by great dangers, we cannot by ourselves stand upright. Give us strength of mind and body, so that even when we suffer because of human sin, we may rise victorious through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. The reading today is from Isaiah chapter 58. If you remove the yoke from around you and the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then the light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom will be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like watered garden like a spring of water, whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. Word of God, word of life. The psalm is Psalm 1. (laughs) Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their their delight delight is in the law of the Lord, and and on this law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by stems of water, which yield their fruit in its seasons, and their leaves do not wither, and all they do they prosper. The The wicked wicked are are not so, so, but are are like chaff that that the wind wind drives drives away. away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the the Lord watches watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Good morning, Faith. She said, I'm back. Yeah, you took a little hiatus. Did you get any inspiration yet? Well, I think a little bit. Do you have any inspiration for us? Okay, okay, let's, let's start again. Faith is telling me that she thinks perhaps I didn't have to do so much work preaching about Revelation all summer. Because she has a much easier way. Would you like to tell us what it is? God is great. God is good. And we thank him for our food. I know there's more. Do you want to say that too? By his hand we are fed. Give us now our daily bread. Well, why is that like the same as Revelation? Because it's true. Because God is great. We learned a lot about God being great. And he's very good. And he gives us what we need. That's it. Well, there's, yeah, you're right. That's it. Thank you, Faith. You just boiled it down. No, we're not quite done with Revelation, though. (laughs) Today is the second to the last week. No, it's not sad today. It's glad. Yeah, it is very good. And then next week, we get to learn about the glorious future. Yeah, what God has promised in the new Jerusalem. When God comes to earth to dwell with his people and set up the new Jerusalem here, it is wonderful. Yeah. Hey, thank you for for helping us understand better today. How about we, um, we just have a little word of prayer before the sermon, okay? Okay, let's pray. Dear Jesus. 
Thank you that you're great and you're good. And you take good care of us. And we don't have to worry. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for the song. Thank you. Goodness is stronger than evil. Love is stronger than hate. Light is stronger than darkness. Life is stronger than death. Victory is ours. Victory is ours through God who loves us. Victory is ours. Victory is ours through God who loves us. This song was written by Bishop Desmond Tutu, a South African priest who fought and won against the apartheid and the racism in his country. He fought with goodness, love, light, and life, and action. He received the Nobel Peace Prize for his determination and leadership. And if you search him on YouTube, you will see the love and joy and peace of Jesus Christ shining right through him. He speaks of the love that brought Jesus Christ to earth to live and to love and to die and rise again. And if you check out enough videos, you will see him dancing in joy as well. He is a man of great joy. Along with the table prayer, Faith said for us, the song I just read for you is also a summary of the book of Revelation, which has, I admit, seemed heavy and long sometimes, just as life can seem heavy and long, especially when evil, not goodness, appears to be winning. Today the sermon is titled, Bringing Down the Ritz, because rich, powerful, brutal, pagan, and blasphemous Rome is going to fall. And it won't be because God aims an asteroid at it and hits it, or pelts it with fireballs or plagues. It will fall because of its presumption that it cannot fall. It's presumption that it will never be accountable for its arrogance and great sin against God and the saints against God and the saints of God. Rome, or Babylon as it is called here, is characterized as a harlot adorned in scarlet and purple and fine jewels and she's sitting on the beast and drinking out of her beautiful goblet the blood of saints and martyrs. This woman is the exact opposite of the soon 
to be revealed bride of Christ, the church, who is the opposite, pure and holy. In her heart, the harlot boasts, I sit as queen, I am not a widow, and I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day her plagues will overtake her, Scripture says. Death, mourning, and famine, she will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. And that's Revelation 18, 7 through 8. So arrogance, pride, success have led Rome to believe that it can do whatever it pleases to whomever it pleases, and will, it will never, ever be accountable to anyone greater because Rome believes there is no one greater. Remember, Rome worships its emperors as God. According to Catherine and Eusto Gonzale, the basic character of the Roman Empire is comprised of four things that we are pretty familiar with, too. A quest for power, greed for luxuries that need that kind of power, the injustice that greed creates, and the idolatry, idolatry that perpetuates the search for unlimited power. And its fruits. The harlot, Rome, has enticed many nations to join with them in its idolatry and luxury and extravagance and violence, and their whole global economy, as it were, is built around it. The merchants, the sea captains, the nations, they are all built around this quest for power. And in John's vision, all the nations are drunk, right along with the harlot, and they're gathering together with the Roman Empire to wage war against the Lamb of God. They will fight together against all that is good and righteous and pure and holy. And then, in John's vision, you know how he kind of slides things in and slides them out, just like dreams do? In John's vision, an angel comes out with great authority, and, and it's, it's so bright, which means it's been in the presence of God. It's so bright, it illuminates the whole world. And it cries out in a mighty voice, not a loud voice, a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. This is a declaration of what's going to happen soon, a moment of revelation, a moment of truth about something that at that moment seems impossible. Now remember, Revelation was written for suffering Christians, many of whom knew people who'd been martyred, many who were fearful they would be. And this is such good news for them because destruction of this earthly power means the redemption of God's people. Destruction of the earthly power and all the evil means redemption of God's people. Jesus had said to his disciples in Luke, the 21st chapter, Now, when all these things begin to take place, stand up and raise up your head, because your redemption is drawing near. And this is the act of justice they've been waiting for. Remember way back in the first couple of weeks, the martyrs were crying out for justice from under the altar of God. Since then, there's many who've lost their friends and families to martyrdom, and they are longing for justice. And think about this. Even God Almighty, whose precious Son, Jesus Christ, was martyred by this empire. Died on a Roman cross by what was called the power of the sword, where a governor could order death. God, too, saw the horror firsthand, and he has longed for justice. But think how long he's waited to judge the nation giving them one chance after another after another to repent and worship him instead of themselves. So when the announcement is made, 
all heaven rejoices. And that, then John hears this great invitation. It's to the church of Jesus Christ, which means it's also to us. Jesus Christ's bride. Who has made herself ready for the beauty and purity of heaven? Listen to the invitation. John writes in Revelation 19, 6 through 9, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty thunder peals, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. For her, to her it has been granted to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. I hope you heard a couple things in that invitation. First of all, it was an invitation. <laughs> so you would had to be invited to come. Secondly, it will be a blessed and happy time, more than we can imagine. More joyful than any family reunion or marriage any of us has ever been to. The marriage feast of the Lamb is the union of Jesus Christ and his church, those he redeemed and made members of the body of Christ, and that includes us. Put yourself inside this invitation. We are being readied through many trials of life as a bride for a groom, and we will wear fine linen, bright and pure. The fine linen we'll be clothed in will be the righteous deeds we have done for Jesus as his redeemed and beloved children. The first, first, and now we're, we're jettisoned back into what's going to happen first. The rider on the white horse appears. And this isn't the horse that was way back at the beginning, the apocalyptic horse. This rider, listen to the scripture. Revelation 19, 11 through 16. Then I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse. Now remember, white is the color of victory in Revelation. So this is going to be about victory. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, many crowns. And he has a name inscribed that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, wearing fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. Lots of victory going to happen. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name inscribed, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now if you think back to the letters to the seven churches, the message to the church at Pergamum described Jesus as the one with a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. Now, do you remember that his sword was and is the powerful word of God? Not a weapon of war, but the powerful word of God. In Hebrews 4.12 we read, Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. In the end, Jesus does battle with the only weapon that matters. 
all weapons that killed and maimed then, and all weapons that can annihilate the earth now, are nothing compared to the word of God. Remember Jesus' words, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will last forever. So to those who were suffering during John's time and during our time, and that might include you, this is a call to stand fast, press on, lift up your head, persevere with the true promises of God's word. This single rider on the white horse, this king of kings and lord of lords can defeat all the armies of any Babylon that has ever risen to power. And as you know, Babylon's continue to rise and fall. And we may even wonder sometimes if we are living in a Babylon now. Well, the battle happens quickly. The beast from the sea and the beast from the earth are captured and thrown to their destruction and death in the lake of fire. Once the leaders are captured, the rest of the armies fall quickly and are destroyed by the two-edged sword, which is the word of God. Jesus Christ, the word of God. Obviously, this is a very mighty spiritual battle that establishes Jesus in view of all. He's established as King of kings and Lord of lords over all heaven and earth. No more emperor worship, no more deception, no more martyrdom, no more hanging on for dear life from one minute to the next. And then something equally marvelous happens as we enter chapter 20. John writes, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit, the depths of the earth from whence evil came holding in his hand the key and a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and locked it and sealed it over him so that he would deceive the nations no more. He would deceive the nations no more. Can you imagine that? until the thousand years were ended, and then he must be let out for a little while, and we'll talk about that next week. This thousand years has become known as the millennium. One thousand years, or a very extended period of time without the presence of evil. A time of great peace and healing. And everybody wants to know when that's going to happen. And, you know, there's literally denominations divided about, you know, I belong to this church. I believe it's going to happen then. I believe it's going to happen then. Nobody knows, just in case you're wondering. But but some people say we're living in that thousand years of peace right now. And if you believe that, (laughs) it's kind of hard to believe that. There's no evil or deception going on because we see it every day. Others believe that it refers to a a thousand-year, an extended period of time right before Christ returns, a time we're waiting for when Christ returns, and there will be this time of peace first. According to what we've read so far today, it could happen right after the conquering battle of the rider on the white horse, whatever that battle ends up looking like. We know there's victory. Another interpretation is that it will happen after Jesus returns. So does anyone know for sure? No. Scripture says only God the Father knows these things. The rest of us live by faith. But here's the important point. We always in Revelation have to keep looking for the main point. There will be an extended period of time when we believers are not being accused by Satan, by evil. There will be a time when there will be truth throughout the world, no deception. God's word, the way, the truth, and the life will be honored. 
The world will have time to heal. People will no longer worship and be deceived by great riches and great power. There will be justice for all. Perhaps even the created earth will have time to mend and flourish as humans sort out what matters most. Can you imagine that? Often we Christians try to look at this whole scenario we've been looking at, this vision, these symbols and all this, and we we try to say, there's the timeline and that's where we are. Usually people get that really, really wrong, embarrassingly wrong. I mean, there are reasons to believe. Maybe we're very close to that battle of victory. But there were reasons to believe that 40, 50 years ago, too. Right after World War II, during World War II. There will always be reasons to think things can't get any worse. But here's three things we can be sure of. One, Almighty God knows all about us and all about the world. God knows what's happening. God does all things well. We can trust ourselves into God's keeping no matter what. Number two, if the sword of God's word is powerful enough to destroy all evil, we need to take it more seriously. We need to read it and study it and understand it. How will we hold to God's promises when the going gets tough if we don't even know what they are and how faithful he has been throughout all of Scripture? We can't make the study of Scripture an optional part of our lives. This is what will hold us firm, no matter what. Number three, Jesus Christ is already King of kings and Lord of lords. But someday all creation, all creation in heaven and earth and under the earth, will bow before him and every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's taken from Philippians 2. We will be part of that mighty throng. In fact, we are part of that mighty throng right now. This is such a great privilege. We belong to Jesus. What is our response? We can do no less than offer ourselves all that we have, all that we are, all that we hope to be. We give to you, our triune God and blessed God, who was and is and is to come, King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. We are going to have just a few moments of meditation now as we um, watch this video. It's a song we've sung before. If you'd like to sing along, please do. If you would just like to worship, please do.
Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, your plan throughout all eternity is so much greater than anything we can imagine. But we know you love us. You're caring for us. And we offer ourselves back to you. Use us in whatever way you can to spread your word, to bring others the peace, the comfort, and the joy that you have already given us. We pray this in your name. Amen. Please stand as we confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God's extraordinary love, let us come near to the Holy One in prayer. You crown your church with steadfast love and mercy. Guide us continually in our baptismal covenant to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Use our diverse gifts in service to the whole people of God. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You make your ways known to all people. Inspire the rulers and leaders of nations with your compassion and mercy. Raise up activists and community organizers to restore places that have been affected by violence, poverty, racism, and inequality. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You provide justice for all who are oppressed and relief to all who are afflicted. Heal those who are bent over by addiction, depression, and anxiety. Set free all who cry out under the weight of mental, emotional, or physical distress. This morning, we bring to you Carl Harmson, Ryan A. League, Terry Miller as she heals from surgery, and those among us who live daily with chronic pain. We pray, too, for those entangled in family dysfunction, that you will heal the wounds and enable restored communication. Speak comfort to those who grieve the loss of loved ones, especially Kim Shields and her family as they grieve the loss of Debbie, Kim's sister. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You call us to delight in the Sabbath. Renew our bodies, minds, and spirits in this worshiping assembly. Give rest to all who lead our congregation in worship, study, and service. Bless the efforts of those who are organizing God's work, our hands. Bless all who participate. We pray, too, for the start of the new school year, our Sunday school program, new member classes, confirmation, youth group, choir, and visitation ministry. Reveal to us where you're already working and inspire us to join you there. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Generations, bless your holy name. We give you thanks for the communion of saints who have gathered in prayer and praise in this place. Support us in your love until we rest forever in you. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Receive the prayers of your children, merciful God, and hold us forever in your steadfast love through Jesus Christ, our holy wisdom. Amen. The peace of Jesus Christ be with you always. 
please share the love and the peace of our Lord Jesus with one another. Please stand. Let us pray. Holy God, gracious and merciful, you bring forth food from the earth and nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts toward those who hunger in any way, that all may know your care, and prepare us now to feast on the bread of life. Jesus Christ, Christ, our Savior Savior and Lord. Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And And also also with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We We lift lift them them to to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is is right right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy.
night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. God of new life, pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Raise us up as the body of Christ for the world. Breathe new life into us. Send us out alive with justice, peace, hope, and love. Let's pray together in the words Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. This morning you'll be receiving communion by intinction. If you're a regular attender here, you know how this works with the chalice. But if it's your first time here, you'll see there's the chalice that will be facing you. So the, the wafer will be handed to you by the communion server. And you can dip it in, either into the wine, which will be on your left, or the grape juice, which will be on your right. If you need gluten-free wafers, please take one from the front compartment and, and dip where you prefer. You are welcome to share in communion if you know Jesus as your Savior. We do not restrict by denomination whether or not you're a member here. This is the Lord's table, and he says to us, taste and see, the Lord is good. So come, all is ready. God's blessings are here for us.
Please stand. What joy it is to share together in the, the feast that is just a little tiny idea of what it will be like when we're at the wedding feast of the Lamb. It's our little peak. <laughs> may, the, um, may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. O oh God, God, our, our life, life, our strength, strength our food, food. We give you thanks for sustaining us with the body and blood of your Son. By your Holy Spirit, enliven us to be his body in the world, that more and more we will give you praise and serve your earth and its many peoples. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Receive the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. And we're going to close today with You Are Holy, and we're going to do it twice. And the second time, we'll do a round. And I don't know, Eric, if you want to move over here. But this side can start the second time, and this side comes in when the first side gets down to that space in the, in the um in the text there we know how to do this let's go <laughs> Share the good news. Thanks be to God. God. Have a great week, everyone. Thank you.